Good morning, Park Avenue. Let's begin our time together by in song as we celebrate Jesus. We lift up his name. We encourage one another. We bring our testimony. We bring our offerings. We bring ourselves to him. Stand as you're able. The words today will be on the screen. There will come a day when the wicked shall cease from their troubling and the weary shall be at rest and we, the saints of the ages, will sit at the feet of the Lord, worshiping and being blessed under him. The wicked shall cease from troubling, the weary shall be at rest. I don't mind being buked and scorned Cause every time you go and talk about me That's just another star in my crown Oh, the wicked seated, thinking about that blessed hope of the beautiful city of God. Amen. Hey, welcome to Park Avenue, everyone. My name is Greg. So glad. Isn't it a beautiful day today? I mean, it is like beautiful. Springtime in Minneapolis, right? Clear sky, 70 degrees. I hope you have some good plans uh, today and that part of your plans included being here. That's, that's really good. Good to see your faces. And we want to welcome everybody who's watching us online as well. Whether you're watching us right now or later in the week, we're glad that you're here. And I see my friend Jennifer Ikomamachko on some crutches back in the back who... Welcome back, Jennifer. Uh, sorry, just a little... Sorry about that. I had just a little personal thing going on there. Like, uh, she had knee surgery. Um, Hey, let's take just a moment 
Um, but before we do this, uh, one of the things we're going to be um, acknowledging today, we want to acknowledge Native American Sunday, Indigenous Persons Sunday, and so we're going to be later in the service, we're going to be taking up a second offering that will, that offering will go to help support indigenous ministries, uh, churches, and also uh, provide money for scholarships for uh, indigenous students. So just a heads up on that. We'll do that um, with the passing of the second plate. And I think there's probably a ways to give electronically on that as well. So anyway, so let's take just a moment and greet one another. Uh, introduce yourself, maybe. Um, I've met some folks already this morning uh, that I had not met yet, or that I met and forgot that I met. And um, so maybe you're the same. Go ahead and meet someone, put a name and face together. I've never, I've never heard about anyone complaining that a church is too friendly. You guys are great. It's so fun to see that. Hey, just real quick as we do, uh, um, Bert Hepp has a did you know coming up about our men's retreat. Bert, you want to come share a little bit about that? Good morning, I'm Bert. Um, did you know it was in the news this past week. There was a recent study about isolation, social isolation. And one of the things it found was that it's really hitting hard. They're considering making it a public health crisis, especially amongst men. So what can we do about it? Here is a solution, the men's retreat, the first weekend in May. Um, it's the opportunity, it's my favorite thing about Park Avenue. It's the opportunity to get to know people better than you can, kind of in a few minutes in the gathering space here and there, you get to know there's a lot of really great men here and they want to get to know you. And this is the best opportunity to do that. There's no, we, it's a pay as you, pay what you can afford. We've gotten some generous donations and we're hoping to get a few more. So don't let money be a barrier for coming. And then a message to people, not the men, but the people who have men in their household. Um, one of the challenges we face with this event is that a lot of men, especially ones that have children in the home, they don't even want to ask if they can go away for a weekend. So I would just encourage you, if you have a man in your house, encourage them. In fact, we'll even let you sign them up. We'll be in the table. 
after the service. And uh, praise be to God for this men's retreat. Thank you. Good morning, Park Avenue. It is celebration time, and in the good song, it's celebration time. Come on. Yeah. This is an opportunity for you to come down and celebrate a, a win in your life. God has been faithful to you in your life. You got a promotion. You passed that class or that test. Um, something has been uplifted in your, in your journey in this now, some transformation, some evolution. And one to two sentences, and I'm going to give you an example of what that looks like. Hi, everyone. My name is Kendrick. I am celebrating my really dear friend, childhood friend, Dorian Bush's 34th birthday. Yeah. Yes. And now it is your opportunity to come. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Barbara Jo. And I had a wonderful week. My son, Troy, and his wife, Erica, and my three granddaughters um, came to visit my other, we, with the whole family. So my daughter, Courtney, and her husband, and their two newer grandchildren. I have five granddaughters, a, a perfect straight, <laughs> I like to say. Well, it was the first time that we could take a picture of all of them all the granddaughters together and all the family together since the youngest was born. So it was such a blessing and so much fun. So I'm grateful. Yes, yes, yes. Hi, my name is Jillian. A couple of weeks ago, I auditioned for a scholarship in the choir down at Winona State University because I wanted to keep my voice. I want to keep my voice healthy and good while I, well, because I won't be doing choir down in Edina anymore, and I got the results back, and I got a $500 scholarship, and I'm going to be in concert choir in Winona State University. So. Woo! Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Fred. And yesterday, 28 years ago, my wife and I got married at this altar. Oh. It's our 28th wedding anniversary. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hi, I'm Mark, and if, if, I, if anyone has cassette tapes that I want, please bring them here, and I'll buy them for, from zero to 25 cents per tape. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Hi, my name is Peggy, Hi. and I have... Um, a celebration for my daughter and for myself. My daughter just celebrated her 23rd birthday. And she will be graduating from Concordia in two weeks. Amen. Thank God for another year around the sun. Well, you know we have to celebrate Stan, his death. But he is in heaven with the Lord. And we are just so blessed that we got to share our time and, and blessings with him. Mary. Oh, I'm they, they know. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name's Monika. Um, I'm just grateful for community. I'm grateful for this church. I grew up here, um, was a very regular attendee when I was younger and growing up, and definitely haven't been as good about going consistently as an adult, but I was going through a bit of a rough time about a month and a half ago, and I was just reminded of what a strong community this is. Like, my friends, my family showed up for me, and I was able to come back to this church, mainly because I was going through a rough time and I needed to be in the house of God, and I just felt welcomed and connected to people, even though I hadn't shown up. So I'm just grateful for this church. As somebody who grew up here and still feels it's my home and a special place, I know that I can uh, be away for a while and come back and nothing really changes. So grateful for that. God is good in all the time. God is good. All right. Hey, let's stand as you're able. Um, join in our call to worship this morning. Your voices matter, all of your voices matter. 
This is one of the reasons we say our call to worship as a community out loud. Uh, we do it um, so your voice can be heard by those around you and in front of you, behind you. And, and somehow when we lend our voices to a call to worship, we're also stepping into the flow of God's voice into our community. And so that's what we get to do when we participate as a community in a call to worship. So here we go. Let's say this because we mean it. God of hope, we see your love poured out for us in all the world. Teach us to live together as one community. Let's worship together. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. He is the Lord of hosts. He is King of kings, Lord of lords. And he has given us a beautiful morning. Let's praise him together. Amen. where he 
um, turned the loaves and fishes into like many, 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 many loaves and fishes. After that miracle, there was another miracle where he sent the disciples off in a boat ahead of him. And shortly after, he walked on the water to the disciple. And they were scared. They were like, it's a ghost, what's happening? And he said, it's me. And I think it was Peter who then said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And he started to sink. He took his eyes off of Jesus in his fear and began to sink. And he said, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of him and said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And then they got into the boat and the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshiped him. They worshiped him. So let's continue to worship together our God, our Jesus, our Lord, who if we keep on eyes, our eyes on him, will not let us fall. Amen. Are we out among the water? The great unknown where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand.
my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you morning that we belong to you we are not afraid as long as we can keep our eyes fixed on you so as we go in those unknown waters of our life we pray that you will show us the way that you will make us feel your gaze that we will be able to continue and not be afraid and we will walk by faith as you have told us to go. And we're so thankful for all that you've done. There are so many things happening in the world. So many things that detracts us, that, that makes us feel insecure. There's so many reasons to be shaken. But there's only one reason to, to keep our feet on solid ground. And this is you. So thank you this morning. We worship you and adore you. Amen. childhood room is open as always across the hall and it's time for intercessory prayer things are gonna be a little different today I'm gonna pray and then pause for a little explanation and then we'll say a different version of the Lord's Prayer all together but at this time the altar is open and I want to say there's nothing magic about coming to pray at the altar in children's ministry, we always say you can pray anywhere, anytime, by yourself, with other people. You can pray with your body. You can pray with music. You can pray with your words. You can pray with your feelings. And you can do any of that anywhere. But sometimes coming to the altar is just a way to kind of focus yourself, a way to say, hey, this is really serious for me. So if you feel like it, you are welcome to come to the altar. But you're also welcome to pray just where you are. So if you would join me, well, we'll pause a little bit longer because the kids are so cute. We love watching them go down. It takes a while for them to come down from the balcony. Do you know on Palm Sunday there were 50 kids downstairs in children's ministry and 12 in the early childhood room? All right, if you would join me in just taking a deep breath paying attention to where you are right now. Lord God, our creator, I thank you so much for each and every person in this sanctuary right now, in this building, watching online. Lord, I thank you because I know that you have called each one of us here today for some reason, some purpose, Maybe it's just to smile at the person sitting next to us. Maybe it's to hear a special word. Maybe it was just to lift our voices in song. But Lord, you have a purpose for us. We come today carrying many things. Some of those things are heavy. Some of those things are scary. We lift up, Lord, conflict in so many parts of the world. Sudan, Ukraine. Just so many parts. There's just trouble in the Middle East. Things that we, we don't know how to solve. We lift up the concerns in our own country about divisions. Lord, we lift up our leaders. We pray, Lord, that you would give our local leaders, our national leaders, our world leaders, 
insight and wisdom that they might see solutions that would lead to your desired peace, that would bring ends to strife. Lord, we come also with burdens that are much more personal and local. They may be burdens, concerns about health, worries about loved ones, um, struggles that we or our beloved ones are dealing with. Lord, we just take those and lay them all before you. But Lord, I also thank you that you are the creator of heavens and earth. You put the stars in their courses. You knew that that eclipse was going to happen. <laughs> How cool, Lord, that everybody was looking up at your heavens, admiring your creation. And you have created each of us in your image, Lord, such that our souls, our hearts, respond to the cycles of your world. That as we feel the days getting a little bit longer, as we feel the sun getting stronger, as we see the little plants coming up out of the earth, Lord, our souls can't help but rejoice. Lord, I pray that we would see those signs of hope, those signs of change in all of those places where we might feel burdened, that we would know that you are there, you are present, you are working in the midst of all of those things. You are a mighty and glorious God, and I thank you for the work that you are doing in each of our lives and in this congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so now here's the explanation. Pastor Greg mentioned that this is Indigenous Peoples Sunday, and so we are going to say a version of the Lord's Prayer that comes from the First Nations versions of the New Testament. And to explain that, how many of you... How many of you have English as your second language? Anybody? How many of you speak another language? If you speak another language or have English as your second language, you might know that sometimes there are things that resonate better for you in that other language. There might be a word, a concept that doesn't, you don't have the right English word for it. So the First Nations version of the New Testament was birthed out of a desire to provide an English Bible that connects in a culturally relevant way to the traditional heart languages of the over six million English-speaking First Nations people of North America. It attempts to follow the tradition of the storytellers of the oral cultures. Many of our native tribes still resonate with the cultural and linguistic thought patterns found in their original tongues. So the translation takes into consideration contextual word choices, idiomatic expressions, etc. It is not a word for word translation, but rather it is a thought for thought translation, sometimes referred to as dynamic equivalence. So as we say the Lord's Prayer together, which comes from Matthew 6, um, I think it'll be up on the screen. Think about that thought for thought concept as we join our voices together. O oh, great spirit, our Father from above, we honor your name as sacred and holy. Bring your good road to us, where the beauty of your ways in the spirit world above is reflected in the earth below. Provide for us day by day the elk, the buffalo, and the salmon the corn, the squash, and the wild rice, all the things we need for each day. Release us from the things that have done wrong in the same way we release others for the things done wrong to us. Guide us away from the things that tempt us to stray from your good word and set us free from the evil one and his worthless ways. Aho. May it be so. Good morning, Park Avenue people. My name is Karen Johnson, and I'm a longtime attender here. And currently, I'm um, one member of the leadership board here at Park. I love that God has uh, created us to be interdependent 
or interconnected, as Native people said. Although our creator is all-powerful and has infinite resources, he's designed us and this world to be interdependent. Although we can look around and see many examples in the world of where people are making choices to not participate in this as God intended, the church, our church, right here at 34th and Park Avenue, is a microcosm of people giving and receiving interdependently. I am a regular giver here, but I'm also a receiver. I'm blessed by worship each Sunday. I'm challenged and encouraged by the messages from the pulpit each week. I'm ch I receive encouragement and support and prayer through the small groups that I'm a part of. All of the ministries we are, all of the ministries we are touched by here at Park, including our children and youth ministries, the gathering room space for people to connect with one another, our care team, the music ministry, and all the other ministries are examples of God's design of interdependence, of both giving and receiving. You will see behind me ways uh, that you can give to Park Avenue's regular offering. And today, as Pastor Greg mentioned earlier, and as Carla um, shared so many different things about, it's Native American Sunday, and we are going to be taking a second offering. This offering is a partnership with the United Methodist Church, and through it, we'll be supporting the existing vital ministries of churches and Native American, of our Native American sisters and brothers. Giving to these ministries will support um, God's kingdom work and the development of new programs and the funding of scholarships through the, in these communities. Our offering scripture today is also taken from first, the First Natives version of scripture, and it says, Creator's blessing rests on ones who are merciful and kind to others. Their kindness will find its way back to them, full circle. The ushers, if you would come forward, please, to take our offering.
are so grateful to be a part of your plan of interdependence and interconnectedness. Just ask your blessing on this offering today, the offering for our church to further its ministries. And God, we pray for the second, your blessing on the second offering as well, that it would further your kingdom work amongst Native peoples. We are so grateful to, to you and all you provide for us. Thank you for the privilege of giving back. In Jesus' name, amen. somebody. You better ask this choir. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. It is so good to see all of you and to be here with you in the sanctuary. Um, I see you up there in the balcony, my balcony peeps. Um, also, to um, those of you who are watching online on YouTube, um, greetings and welcome to this service of worship. It is a beautiful day outside today. On the heels of a, uh, of a beautiful weekend, feels like spring may have finally, reluctantly, begrudgingly sprung. <laughs> I know we're all anxious to uh, get out there and enjoy this wonderful weather, so I promise not to keep you more than two, three hours two, three hours tops. I think I just heard somebody mutter under their breath, uh, you won't be preaching to yourself if you go beyond five, 10 minutes. I'm reminded of the pastor um, who was standing outside uh, the sanctuary gazing at a wall. And a um, young boy walked up beside him and cheerfully asked, what you doing, Reverend? What you, what you looking at? And the pastor replied somberly, this plaque lists the names of all the men and women in our church who died in the service. Oh, the boy replied, somewhat confused, and then he continued, well, which service was it, Reverend, the 8.30 or the 10 o'clock? <laughs> I think of that story sometimes, Greg, when I <laughs> enter worship. Uh, and it, it gives me joy. It makes me smile. But I also smile and receive joy because the Bible says this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. R.C. Sproul Jr. wrote, the beauty of the day is not that it is new, but that we are being made new. The glory of the day is not that it marks a change, but that we are being changed. I want to thank the uh, volunteers and staff who helped make this worship, this joyous worship possible today. The greeters and ushers, soundboard, PowerPoint, and video operators, the wonderful gospel choir, our praise and worship team, musicians, and the folks who have spoken, prayed, and led various segments of this worship this morning, can we acknowledge their service with a hand praise? Yeah. And now, sisters and brothers, I believe there's a word from the Lord. Our scripture today is 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. 1 John is the epistle or letter of John, as distinguished from John's gospel. And it's located near the end of the New Testament, after Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter. 
Then you get to 1 John. Again, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. I encourage you to listen to the scripture as I read it. The Bible says faith comes from hearing the word. But you also can read along with me uh, on the screen behind me. Maybe not yet, but it should be up there shortly. Uh, or on your Bible, in your Bible, uh, your Bible app. Um, there also are Bibles in the pews that you can uh, read and take advantage of. Um, I'm going to read from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. 1 John chapter 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him will purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins, no one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of God for the people of God. The time that has been set aside for this task, I would speak to you from the topic a legacy of love. A legacy of love. Pray with me, please. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Summer Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Sing with me, please. Great is thy Eternal and faithful God, the moment of preaching has come. Anoint your servant at this time that I may preach the word you have placed on my heart with boldness, humility, clarity and insight, passion and power, fervor and flow. 
Remove from me everything that displeases you, and from this sanctuary, take away every hindrance to your presence, that I may speak and your people may hear a life-giving, uplifting, way-making word. This is my prayer, and all who witness and agree before the Lord say together, amen. A legacy of love. On this second Sunday following Christ's resurrection on Easter, I'm pleased to say that there is good news for all of us. The good news is this, Christ is still risen. Oh, y'all don't hear me this morning. I said Christ is still risen. As we look around this, Especially on a day like today, we witness creation is awakening to the hope and possibility of new life. You and I not only are witnesses to new creation, but also vessels of the risen Christ at work in us. In one of the gospel accounts of Jesus after he was resurrected, Jesus appears unexpectedly to his disciples. The disciples didn't expect it. Jesus expected to show up where Jesus showed up. The disciples were terrified and thought he was a ghost. But Jesus invited them to see and touch his hands and feet, pointing out that ghosts don't have flesh and bones. And then he asked for food and sat and ate with them. Something else that ghosts don't do. This recollection from Luke's gospel makes the dramatic and life-affirming point that Christ is risen indeed. Luke writes that everything written about Jesus in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Today's text from 1 John continues that refrain with a word that encourages us to move beyond the passive acceptance that Christ has risen to actively demonstrating his resurrection. We must move from believing to embodying the resurrected Christ. Are y'all with me this morning? As we prepare to unpack this text, however, I must caution that there is trouble or tension in the text even though its overarching theme is God's incredible love for us. You see, right after describing the awesome love of God that adopts us as God's children, this word takes a sharp turn and sets the unattainable standard that no one who abides in Jesus sins. Whoa, 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 John, I, Are we adopted by divine love or rejected by sin? Which is it? How can we reconcile the benevolent blessedness captured in verses 1 through 3 of this text with the hopelessly high bar set in verses 4 through 7? And and here's another tension. Earlier in John's letter, in this epistle, at chapter 1, verses 9, he writes these familiar words. He says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But later in today's text, John writes, no one who sins has either seen him or knows him. What gives here? Are we supposed to admit our sins and receive God's forgiveness, or shall we strive for perfection knowing at the onset we will fail? And here's one more tension in the text while I'm on a roll here. Although it's a subtle one. Verse 1 says, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And this passage, of course, describes the world's hostility to followers of Christ. But beloved, it also speaks to the reality of oppressed and marginalized groups within the community of believers who have experienced social degradation. The world doesn't see us as children of God because it doesn't see our parent, which is God. 
and it doesn't see God in us. With these various tensions in mind, I want to lift three observations from the text. First, we are children of God. Act like it. We're children of God. Act like it. Second, God set a high bar for God's adoptees, and it is non-negotiable. Finally, show them the Jesus in you. Show them the Jesus in you. All of us who confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior are God's children. We didn't earn it, don't deserve it, can't pay for it, and don't fully appreciate what it's worth. Our adoption was paid for by Jesus' sacrifice of blood shed on the cross. Galatians 4 and 4 says this when it says, but when the, fulfill, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. As children of God, we hold a unique and elite status. We relate to God not only as creator and master, but as parent who has adopted us into the divine lineage. We are co-heirs with Jesus. Romans 8 and 16 says as much, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So as heirs to the kingdom of God, we ought to act like heirs to the kingdom of God. Amen, somebody. It's not supposed to be a secret identity, beloved. Our holy heritage should be in plain sight, not by bragging, but simply being unashamed and, dare I say, but not behaving childishly. <laughs> Y'all ain't going to help me this morning. <laughs> we are children, but that doesn't mean we have to act childish. Children is our position, our status, if you will. Childish, on the other hand, is a conduct. It's how we shouldn't be behaving. You know childish behaviors. Petulant, petty, small-minded, short-sighted, self-absorbed, self-centered, and immature. Okay, that might be just a list of my shortcomings. <laughs> but maybe one or two apply to you too. Not, not the entire list and not all the time, but sometimes each of us behaves in a childish manner that is unbecoming of our status as children of the God. Amen? Here's the thing. Children make mistakes, and parents who love their children discipline them for their mistakes. But parents don't stop loving the child when and because the child falls short of expectations. Misbehavior is not grounds to revoke an adoption. You can't send your child back just because they mess up. If they did, all the children would be back and nobody would have any parents. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Nothing. So rest assured in your adoption, sisters and brothers. Be confident in your standing, resolute in your faith that you are a child of God. Turn to someone on your right or left right now and tell them with conviction, I am God's beloved child. If you are alone watching this online, you can say these words to yourself, and I urge you to say it again. I am God's beloved child. Now turn to someone else and say, or say this to yourself, God adopted me, no backsies. <laughs> no backsies. We spend way too much time, sisters and brothers, second-guessing our belovedness, worrying that something we've done or fail to do will cancel our kinship with God. That is childish thinking. Children misbehave, but they also are forgiven. Children mess up, 
but they also mature. We mature as children of God as we yield to the enduring power of the resurrection to make a new creation in us. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Spiritual maturity. This maturity in Christ that I'm speaking of is not about age, beloved. It's about letting everything old pass away and new birth take its place. Old sin, pass away. Old guilt, pass away. Old self-doubt, pass away. Old shame and blame, pass away. Anything and everything contrary to Christ's new creation in you, let it pass away. Let it go, saints. You are God's beloved children. Act like it. Let's move on. Some people believe that God doesn't have standards for human behavior or that being a good person, as we define that term for ourselves, is sufficient. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. God has explicit expectations for our conduct, and the bar is set quite high. How could it not be high with Jesus as the standard bearer? So how are we supposed to measure up to Jesus who was without sin but took on the sins of the world that we might have salvation in him? Simple. We can't. But we absolutely can use the life of Jesus to coach and inspire our conduct. And we have the word of Christ to guide us. In verse 6 of today's text, John says, No one who abides in Jesus sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. I like the message translation, which paraphrases that passage in this way. No one who lives deeply in Christ makes a practice of sin. None of those who do practice sin have taken a good look at Christ. They've got him all backwards. The question then I have for you, beloved, is have you taken a good look at Christ or have you got him all backwards? Have you taken a good look at Christ's call to love your neighbor as yourself or are you putting up fences in your backyard? Have you looked closely at Christ who said the first shall be last and the last shall be first? Or are you climbing over the backs of others to get to the top? Have you looked good at Christ's command to care for the least, the lost, and the left out? Are you clinging to the backward belief that I got mine, let them get theirs? Have you looked closely at Christ who said, turn the other cheek? Or do you blindly believe in an eye for an eye? And have you looked closely at Christ's command to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Or are you worshiping in installments, <laughs> making partial payments on the Jesus layaway plan? Jesus sets the standards for our conduct as children of God. He is the high bar for our behavior. But he also is our mediator, advocating forgiveness when we fall short of his example. Forgiveness, however, does not change our lower God standards. I think we sometimes try to play ourselves, try to fool ourselves into believing that since Jesus will forgive us, we can negotiate more favorable and less stringent terms of conduct. Y'all don't hear me this morning. Don't get it twisted. God's forgiveness is based on you and I having a repentant heart, a contrite spirit. It's not a get out of jail free pass to be used without remorse or repercussion. And continual or habitual sin contradicts the code of conduct expected of a child of God. So honor the code, saints. I asked earlier, are we supposed to admit our sins and receive God's forgiveness, or shall we strive for perfection knowing at the onset we will fail? The answer is yes. Yes. Confess our sins and shortcomings with a repentant heart and receive God's forgiveness. 
but also continue to follow the model of Christ. The Apostle Paul put it this way, forgetting what lies ahead and straining forward to what lies, excuse me, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal, toward the mark for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. (laughs) The gospel singer Donnie McClurkin was more succinct. He said, we fall down, but we get up. (laughs) For a saint is just a sinner who fell down, but got up. In Jesus Christ, God has set a high standard of conduct for the children of God. And by the grace of God, we are forgiven when we fall short. Let's move on to our final point. First two points speak to our position as children of God and the high standard for God's God's adoptees established by the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. But our final point speaks to an external obstacle to our adoption, namely that the world doesn't recognize children of God because the world doesn't recognize God, the parent. Chapter 3, verse 1 in the message puts it this way, the world does not recognize us or take us seriously because it has no idea who God is or what God is up to. Sadly, that statement was true 2,000 years ago and is true today. The world doesn't see God or acknowledge God at work in us. There are lots of places to point fingers toward and to cast blame false religions and false prophets, the elevation of self, the preoccupation with status and privilege, religious sectarianism, polarization of Christians in the camps based on political ideology, and the general decline in the number of Christian faithful, just to name a few. But despite those facts, if we are honest, And we're in church, folks, so let's be honest. Some of the blame falls squarely on our shoulders for failing to represent Jesus. The world doesn't know us because it doesn't know God, but it's also true that the world doesn't know God because it doesn't know us. Somebody ought to say amen. We need to represent Jesus, church. Show the world we are striving to live up to the high calling of our adoption in Christ. In other words, show them the Jesus in you. It's a perilous proposition, I know. We risk ridicule, exclusion from friends, strangers, and even family. But fear should not deter us from revealing the Christ in us. And neither should our disappointment in the shortcomings and failures of others. If anything, it should propel us forward. Humanity heaps a multitude of suffering on its fellow human beings. Brutality, oppression, economic exploitation, forced starvation, human trafficking, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and so much more. And as a result, the world doesn't see people forced or abandoned to the margins. And it doesn't see or recognize God in the world or in marginalized people. But that doesn't give us a pass on promoting the goodness of God. Despicable behavior in others is not an excuse for us to retaliate, seek vengeance, or just sit on the sidelines hiding our light beneath a bush. Christ is still the bar, the high calling. When faced with injustice, it's up to us to show Jesus. Oh, y'all didn't hear, so I'm going to say that again. When faced with injustice, it's up to us to show Jesus. Don't take my word. It's in the book. 2 Corinthians 5 and 20 says, we are ambassadors for Christ. 
since God is making God's appeal through us. So let's show the appeal of Jesus. When we show hospitality to strangers, we show the Jesus in us. When we stand with immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, we show the Jesus in us. When we walk for hunger or to cure disease, we show the Jesus in us. We show the Jesus in us when we pray for peace and work for justice. We show the Jesus in us when we fight to save our planet from ruinous climate change. We show the Jesus in us when we speak against income inequality, health disparities, and achievement gaps. And we show the Jesus in us when we love each other, friends and enemies, family and strangers, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, and people of every faith and no faith, reds, blues, and independents. When we love so wide and deep the world knows we are Christians, we show the love of Jesus in us. The risen Christ is continually creating new life in each of us. New hope, new joy, new peace, new abundance, new healing, new deliverance new courage to conquer sin. Every day we believe in Christ's resurrection. Every day we call on the name of Jesus. The resurrection continues to manifest and unfold in each of us. We are Christians under construction, beloved. <laughs> that is Christ's legacy of love. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.
strive to seek your face as we try to embody and uh, show what it means to be the children of, of you, God. We just pray this morning that you would open the eyes of our heart so we may see what it feels like, we may see what, what's next in line for us. Sometimes we're so used to walk with a pebble in our shoes. We don't know where it is and we just use, we keep walking. We will ourselves. Maybe we just need to stop, take the shoe off and remove that pebble. So as we sing, open the eyes of our heart, Lord. Open the eyes of our heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Maybe you want to show us what to do to, to remove that pebble from our shoe. So show us where the pebble is in our life. Jesus. And we'll gladly just attend to it. And this way we can walk more gladly. We can show what it is to follow you and to go where, you sh where our destination is. So we thank you this morning for the opportunity to worship you. For the opportunity to worship you, to be with you, to spend the time to listen to you. I pray that something from this service has touched somebody in a way that we may not live the same. So this is our prayer this morning. And we promise to continue to abide richly and dwell in you. Amen, church. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. You said a lot today, and there's that one line that I just can't get out of my head we are children of God, act like it. And then you said a lot of other stuff to go with that. And um, I just said, I wonder if that's something that we can sort of lean into this week, right? As you're going through your day, day in, day to day activity, that line right there, I am a child of God. <laughs> am I acting like it? Am I acting like it right here in this place we call our home church? Am I acting like it when I'm dealing with some of the stresses of family? Am I acting like it when I'm trying to get through the day at my job, dealing with a colleague that perhaps is a little bit difficult? I'm a child of God. Am I acting like it? That's the message I've got in my heart today, and I'll carry with me this week, and I hope you will too. There's um, a couple things going on uh, where we can live into that uh, this morning, actually. One is, so you know, we have our gathering room where there's, we gather together and we have conversations, have some snacks, and we can uh, live into that being a child of God and acting like it with one another through those conversations, right, Mark? And then we have uh, down in, down the stairs in the dining room a uh, conversation, a monthly conversation over soup that uh, uh, continuing conversations about how we become, continue to become a community, a church of welcome and belonging. And today we're going to be learning from multiracial couples uh, here at Park Avenue. And uh, there is child care, correct? And there is child care for that uh, up in the youth room, so that's available as well. And uh, remember um, men uh, or anybody who is connected to a man who thinks this might be a good idea, uh, the men's retreat is coming up, and a week from today is the last day to register. So um, if you haven't registered, then I would encourage you to to do that and um, be a part of connecting with, uh, with folks at this mentor retreat. 
uh, a lot of other things happening too. I'm a child of God. I'm going to act like it. All right. Can you stand and um, you receive a word of grace as we leave today? If I could uh, see your eyes, no need to bow your heads. Uh, let me see your eyes and uh, receive a word of grace as we uh, as we leave today. And now to this one who is able to keep you from falling. And as Stephen shared with us today, when we do fall, is able to help us get back up. And lead us to into the presence of the glorious presence of God. To Jesus, our Savior, be all glory and majesty and power and honor and to Jesus alone. And as we say every week here at Park Avenue, I can do, I can do all, things all things through Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ who strengthens me. Strength. We can do, can do all, things all things through Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ who strengthens us. Strengthens us. Have a great day, everyone.